Hey there, I'm here with Bobby and Matt and they have a really cool project going on here and I wanted to share with you what's going on here. And you probably know Bobby, he's in a bunch of videos, one about your permaculture farm, we did one about your pigs and then about farming with kids and family mm -hmm. stuff. So a lot of great videos and I'll leave those linked down below. But you probably don't know Matt, if you do, you're a super fan because Matt did appear in a couple of videos at Raleigh City Farm. I met Matt through working at Raleigh City Farm and they're working on a really cool project here and I let Bobby sort of tell you a little bit about it. I just want to show you what's going on here because I want to check back in with them um, throughout time as the project moves along. Uh, this is something they've been working on for a while and planning and now just starting to get things going and I've been really mm -hmm. excited to you know, keep up with it, but also I wanted to share it with everybody because it's it's super cool. So Bobby, mm -hmm. if you want to tell everyone what's going on here, it would be great. Yeah. So this is a, a pilot project for something we're calling uh, regenerative cluster developments. And it's really a riff on development supported agriculture where we are using small, compact, little villages that would scale to at most like 14 lots. Um, all that is, is being compact, we can put it on shared infrastructure, same well, same septic, keep lots small and create more of both, you know, a, a, a place of community, um, more affordable housing instead of everybody having to have the same redundant infrastructure, but at the same time trying to permanently preserve um, 85 to 90 percent of the original parent track in a um, contiguously operated forestry, agroforestry, or primarily pasture-based livestock operations. So, I mean, the main impetus for me was how do you overcome escalating land costs in this area to keep um, large tracts of land um, in their, their, their sort of present use. Okay, so this is sort of a, um, a test case here, or like proof of concept. So we're yeah. talking how many acres, how many families, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's 60 acres total that we're subdividing into four lots okay. now this is it'll have six dwelling units two of them will have two dwelling units on them but this is sort of a personal model that we'll eventually build a move to um, but it is established in some of the legal uh, frameworks ownership models and how it how it would be I mean acre and a half was the minimum just based on local zone, zoning we would have made them smaller if we if we could okay so yeah. what what we're saying here is that you know we have a 60 acre lot and then each family will have their own little lot in there but there'll be a lot of communal space that's shared between them for yeah, different operations yeah. and stuff all the homes are are sort of towards the close road frontage so we can gravity flow everything to one central septic tank and septic system for instance but um yeah it'll all be positioned strategically with some shared farm uh, infrastructure like the, the well and a, a open pavilion kitchen area that people have access to. Cool. So Matt, you and your wife are part of this group here and can you talk a little about your involvement and you know why you wanted to be part of this project? Yeah. So uh, my wife and I moved to North Carolina in 2014 uh, to downtown Raleigh where we still live. Um, really in the last, I don't know, five years since we've moved here. Uh, within half an hour of Raleigh, it's all been bought up and subdivided and developed. But before that, um, kind of like Bobby and uh, this kind of rural cluster development model that he's been thinking about, we were talking about how do we kind of conserve as much land as we can around Raleigh um, for when we retire to move out of downtown um, and kind of get away from the city a little bit and just you know, we're thinking it was going to be cost prohibitive if we waited until retirement to buy that land. And so around that time that we were looking at land, Bobby and I met each other. Um, we kind of started up a friendship and talking more. And he started coming out and like looking at different parcels with me and helping me think through um, kind of what it would mean to own land and, and kind of live out there. And um, and also started talking to me about this this development model that he was looking into and i guess the more we talked um the more kind of reality set in in terms of like what i was capable of doing myself versus what it would make sense to try to split with um with other people and so he really tried to encourage us to think about doing something communally as opposed to just on our own, not necessarily with this particular project, just you know, with people that we knew in Raleigh. Um, and then our wives got to know each other and I think all of us just kind of became, you know, closer and um, so they entertained the op idea of us becoming involved. You know, before we became involved, it was just their family. So 
um, it was kind of a big step to agree to move outside the family and include other people in and um, and it's been great for us so very, very yeah. cool so there obviously been a ton of planning going on in the last few years with this project but you guys have started work so can we go take a look at some of the stuff you've done and sort of talk about some of the plans sure yeah all right so you guys have started doing some work here and what's going on behind us can you talk a little about what happened so far yeah we're standing in the sort of our phase two road corridor where we were just standing was phase one we may built the main entrance entrance road um, commercial turnaround in a um, farm metal quonset building this is sort of the core of our farm related infrastructure now we're getting ready to finish the the permitting for taking the rest of the road into where we're going to put the village okay so you did some clearing you took out a bunch of trees and some thinning but this is going to be the main road that goes back to where the dwellings are going to be, right? Right, right. And um, so the the, tr the the main forestry thinning. So when we bought this property, it was about 17 year old pines, and we um, took some time to find the right logger. But we just completed a considerable um, our first thinning um, that's generated us revenue to then reinvest in the next phase of infrastructure. Okay, so it may be hard for people to see. So let's let's head back and kind of talk about what's going to be going on back there. Sure. As we're walking down this road here to where the dwellings are gonna be, there's a lot more going on than just cutting a road through the trees here. Can you talk on some of the different yeah. strategies and things involved with this? Yeah, we, we try to be strategic with our, our forestry thinning operations to overlay um, where our main like pull roads and cut roads were gonna be with uh, the future primary and secondary roads on the, the greater farm property. So that would include the main gravel um, private road into the, the village, plus additional roads that we'll be using for moving about and managing this property on the farm um, elsewhere for paths or um, uh, ATV trails and livestock management. Okay, and there's some other dual, dual purposes, obviously like access into, but will there be other things that are incorporated with the road? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the road is, is pretty much a high, high real estate corridor. So as you saw early on, we'll be creating planter berms on both sides of the road as we cut out the ditch for drainage and we take all the, the topsoil strippings and stumps um, to build the road. That'll get pushed into two big planting berms on this property. And that'll be, uh, because it's gonna have the most um, visibility and access because it's on the main road, that's where we'll put things of higher, higher needs. Um, you know the, some of the perennials that may need pruning or more or um, harvesting blueberries for instance whereas everything else on the property is going to be have a different sort of management needs okay so stuff that needs more input more access and more attention yeah we'll put mm -hmm. that on the road corridor which makes sense because yeah. we'll be passing by all the time yeah and the berms give us a great place to create um good drainage for because this this property is you know it's poor drain soils shallow soils so um, to, to, to grow the things that are higher purpose, higher value, they're, they're more likely to need uh, better drainage around their root crown. Yeah, so we're back in kind of the village part. So we have four individual lots that are gonna be owned by each of kind of the four members of the LLC. And then across from us over here is gonna be a communal pavilion structure, uh, and then also a well and transformer, which is gonna provide all of the water and uh, all the electricity to the four individual lots. Okay, so I think that's important to understand that you guys are gonna be sharing utilities. Can you talk on that a little bit, why that's a big part of the plan here? Yeah, um, I mean, really, it's just trying to reduce the redundancy. I mean, a, a lot of these, you know, the typical subdivision model for a rural um, community is gonna be, typically have on-lot well and septic, so each home has to have their own, their own systems and maintain their own systems, but, here, it just makes sense to share it together, put the homes together, um, uh, reduce capital costs and long-term operation and maintenance, and then it affords you uh, the economy of scale to invest in better, better infrastructure. Um, you know, we can we can overcome about any um, low yield issues with the well just just doing um, bigger storage systems. But you know, this is sometimes you often often. Um, 
the, the septic, suitable septic areas will dictate kind of where in a landscape it makes sense to, to, to build as well. And I mean, we are, we brought the road in up sort of down this, into the saddle, the, the main village. Homes are clustered on this sort of high saddle landscape feature in our suitable septic areas, which we're lucky to get here. We're up on the hills that we'll, we'll pump into. And that, that kind of overall, just providing good drainage, um, is kind of why we had to kind of punch the road as far back into this property that we did. Okay, and as you guys mentioned, there's gonna be four families here, four lots, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what do you see as a sort of a model that you're trying to push towards, like a certain size that you think it'll be working? And also talk about yeah. a little about the ownership and how that works with this model. Yeah, I mean, this, this one, the four lot model is, is different just because it's, it's meeting our kind of specific needs and knowing that the demographics would be different than those that we're going to target to in the, the larger model. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons for that cap is it's, it's basically, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a challenge is that you, you, the main goal here is to set enough uh, collectively own and purchase the large piece of land um, and keep much of that in, in, in a, a agriculture or forestry land use, but you, and, and that, which is gonna limit the size of the individual lots, but then you need enough lots to subdivide out to, to have enough collective investment to overcome the high land costs. So the 12 to 14 is kind of that sweet spot. Um, and one reason actually just keeping us under, for our state regulations, having to have a public water system. So as soon as we have like 15 lots that kicks us into a much um, higher standards for the type of well or water system we've got to put in place as well as the monitoring for that but also i think again this is it's the primary land use here is not subdivision so keeping it small and i think also you know the community dynamics of that community i think there's too much noise there's enough noise at like 12 to 14 lots where it buffers out any like um i think issues but it's not so big that you lose a sense of community. So that's kind of just based on the research, that seems like uh, a reasonable size to sort of stop for A, B, and C reasons. Yeah, and we're still working through some of the legal components of it right now, because mm -hmm. we're in the process of subdividing out these four lots. Um, you know, traditionally you'd probably be doing an HOA, we're trying to get around that. Um, so we'll all collectively continue to own kind of the 54, 55 acres out here as part of the LLC, uh, but then each kind of family group that owns a 25% interest in that LLC is also going to be deeded their own individual lot that can essentially do whatever they want, but we are tying some mm -hmm. uh, restrictive covenants to that. So we're working through the logistics of how you tie those restricted covenants and the deeds back to mm -hmm. the LLC and ownership and a stake in that. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, so I would obviously have some questions because it's not a traditional HOA really in that regard. And yeah. it seems like the model you're putting together is one that probably is pretty uncommon. So there's, are there a lot of like legal stuff you guys are trying to figure out right now and like how that really plays out and, you know, like yeah. the sort of the community and how that's built both legally and like just how it's gonna happen in real life too, right? Yeah, um, I mean, an HOA is a whole, kind of separate entity from, you know, what in this case would be the LLC and the individual people. It's um, kind of a nonprofit entity that's set aside and we're trying to kind of keep that out and tie directly between the LLC and individual ownership. Um, legally, the people we've talked to have not pursued an approach like that. And so um, we're kind of talking through with them, I think still the best way to do that um, and link everything together. Sorry, what were you yeah, say? I was gonna think what makes it unique from an HOA is um, about this is that we're trying to have all the shared infrastructure that's not on the individual lot um, needs to, is, is owned by the farm and so typically the HOA is responsible for that and there's long-term agreements but trying to not have the HOA model which really doesn't fit the core nature of having a for-profit farm that's where we're still trying to um, figure out how to tie that but it's important for either model that the, the the lot owners have some skin in the game and have some financial ownership in the farm now we've realized too that we and with the operating agreement for this property is we've set a we don't want the farm cost to escalate right we don't want to if someone's going to buy just wants to sell a lot and then needs to sell their shares in the farm we don't want that to become like based on market rates and it's a huge cost burden because they often would have to have cash to buy into the farm. 
So we've set a rate where it's like the equity that you put into it at any point, um, you know, we, we look at, we adjust it for inflation, it's prorated based on the other years. And then there's like a small, like to a 10% markup on the inflation rate. So it's like really, you just, it's just a stable place to put your money. We're not looking at it as like a, a place to make money is like land investment. We want to keep it in perpetuity. You can't control, people can still make equity in their lot, but we don't want the, the land itself to escalate. And we want people to find other forms of value um, in that. There's other forms of wealth than just a monetary return on that. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. There's definitely yeah. reasons why people would want to live in this kind of model. Yeah, and part of that is also trying to keep people from potentially selling their lots in the future to somebody who maybe doesn't fit with what the other the other owners envision for for the land. Right. Um, so, so you put, you know, you kind of have some control over that. All right, so a lot of stuff to be sorted out, obviously both in terms of yeah. legal and how this is all gonna play out, but also in the actual farm and how it works. So as we try to wrap things up, uh, what are, in terms of the actual farm business side of it, I know every sort of model will be different depending on probably where it is and what they can do, but what sort of farm business enterprises do you en envision for this property? Yeah, so this this is a, you know, more the rural development model. So, you, you know, we say it's development supported ag versus ag supported development, which might be more of a suburban model where you've got, you know, a CSA vegetable farm and more intensive enterprises. So, you know, often the the land base that we're going after here is trying to at least have like a minimum of 50 acres set aside for the farm kind of drives, you know, what sort of enterprises make sense as like the base sort of land use model, which is going to be some form of forestry, agroforestry, um, and setting up the infrastructure to provide uh, long-term land for responsible grazers. Right, and that fits very, and really everything's kind of moving towards a savanna kind of land cover anyway, and acknowledging how these lands were managed, you know, thousands of years. So. Um, you know, it'll, it'll kind of move more towards a mixed hardwood and less pine over years here, but we're going to take the, you know, the pines to, to maturity and, and get money off that. Um, we'll have, you know, I think there's the secondary aspects that any, um, for us, we're going to have specific perennial crops planted down that road corridor that are suited to this site. And, you know, I, I envision each one of these clusters having their own collective kind of like almost value added enterprise in a way that they all contribute to beyond the base model because those base model the day to day to manage all that land is minimal there would be intermittent you know forestry activities or you've got uh, the the rancher that's able to cover that ground with appropriate rest on their own using the power of the animals so there's not like you don't need tons of day to day effort there but it's sort of the the still the pro, you know the value added pro products that or the uh, processing equipment or something that makes it niche to each community that the community can sort of invest in if that makes if that makes sense yeah and then the only yeah. other thing would potentially be which we've kind of loosely discussed um, to the extent anybody doesn't want to take on an enterprise but somebody's looking for land or land to access the possibility of leasing out portions of the land so Bobby had mentioned for instance you know um, some sort of responsible grazing approach, right? If we don't want to man the animals ourselves, the potential to lease that that out. So yeah, and that's and that's one of the goals here is to create land access to a next generation of regenerative grazers, which is you know our primarily our farm business model. We do that on on leased land, um, but you know again, it's 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 trying to create more opportunities of people that value the ecosystem services of that ranching model and the fact that the animals are consolidated to one point in space at a very short point of time on a property it makes the rest of it very accessible to provide uh, benefits to you know those living here in the village all right guys well i got a ton more questions but uh we'll try to, <laughs> try to keep this as serious as we can and you know what i'll definitely try to follow up as much as i can as as this progresses i think it's a really um unique and interesting model that ties in a lot of really nice values and, and some great people. So thanks for sharing with us guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for coming.